A talk with freedom fighters from different areas of the African diaspora up next on Evening Exchange. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Kojo Namdi. Welcome to Evening Exchange. As we prepare to mark the 30th anniversary of the March on Washington, each of us who happened to be around in 1963 have various memories of that day, while many of us involved in the civil rights movements of the 60s can boast of having a working knowledge of the writings of C.L.R. James or W.E.B. Du Bois, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, few of us can say that they have advised or defended these great thinkers in a court of law. My first guest can. Meet Conrad Lynn. For more than 60 years, he has worked on hundreds of civil rights cases, everything from the first efforts to desegregate the U.S. Army to defending the Black Panther Party and members of other radical organizations. Mr. Lynn has written about his illustrious career in his book, There Is a Fountain. Welcome, Conrad Lynn. I'm to happy to 32. be here. I'm happy to be here. You have mentioned that this is the first time a black university has invited you to be on a broadcast at such an institution. Why is that? Well, I, I understand now. I, at first, I was unhappy about it because as a lawyer, I did not make much money in the kind of cases that I handle. And a great deal of my income came from speaking at various colleges. Uh -huh. They were always colleges of the North, and the West, <laughs> but never in the Deep South. And uh, I could understand uh, a Southern college like Duke mm -hmm. not inviting me, but I was unhappy that Howard never invited me. Could it have been because during the earlier part of this century when you were a, an undergraduate student at Syracuse University, you first joined the Young Communist League and had a reputation throughout a part of your career as being associated either with the Communist Party or Marxist-Leninist organizations, and that made some black organizations a little afraid to be associated with Conrad Lynn. Well, they were not only a little afraid, they were very much afraid <laughs> and made it very plain that they would not invite me to speak. The only uh, college uh, that ever, uh, the only black college was Lincoln University. On one occasion, I spoke at Lincoln. But despite that, you went on to have an, as we said, illustrious career. And I wanted for you to reflect for a little while on what occurred to you when you, like all of us, saw the Rodney King beating on television. Because the first chapter of your book deals with a notorious case in New York called the Harlem Six, right. which was a murder case which was precipitated by something called the Fruit Stand Riot of 1964, in which a number of young people under 12 years old were being beaten viciously by police officers. And when a few people attempted to stand up for them, they too were viciously beaten. Could you tell our viewers a little bit more about that case and about how you see the whole issue of police brutality, particularly against African Americans, in the light of the Rodney King beating? Yes. Uh, there, these little children were coming from a, a school uh, around 115th Street and Lenox Avenue in, in, in Harlem. And uh, they were coming home for lunch. And it was, uh, uh, there was a store, a fruit store there on the corner of uh, 116th Street and Lenox Avenue. And he, the man had his fruit out on the stand in the open. And uh, so one of the little girls, about eight years old, she saw this grapefruit and it looked like a ball to her. So she took the grapefruit and threw it. And, and the other children started throwing. Now the proprietor who was of Italian descent, he understood these children. So he blew his whistle for the usual cop who was on the beat and who would understand these children. But LaGuardia, the mayor, was anticipating a long, hot summer. And without notice to anybody, he had put in the basements of the public buildings in that area these heavily armed riot police who were big men, specially trained with uh, flak jackets. 
Tactical and, squad, they call it. Yeah, the tactical squad. And so when they blew the whistle, instead of the man, the usual cop on the beat, they had th these, these, these uh, big cops came out. Goons. These, these, yes. <laughs> and uh, they started beating these little children. Well, it just happened at that time, as the little children were screaming, uh, these boys, 17, 18, and 19, were in a karate class in that area. And they just happened to be ending their session, and they came out, and they saw these cops on um, these children, and they rushed, and they were trained in karate. Mm. So they were able to clear the way for the, to keep the little children from being beaten so badly, and to haul off the cops until the crowd collected, because the crowd, by the thousands, would mm. have died. Mm -hmm. And the cops fought their way out and left the scene. Now, just a, a week later, of this Jewish lady in, in, on Lenox Avenue had a store, Lenox Avenue on 116th Street. She had a, a store and she was being robbed by some uh, young men. And she, they called a police, and she was killed in the course of the robbery and her husband was wounded. And so th that was, of course, brought to the attention of the police right away. And the police immediately went and got the leaders, the, what they considered the leaders, of the fruit stand riot. That is those young men who were defending the young people who were beating, the, the children who were beating, be, being beaten up were the young men arrested for the murder of the two people in that clothing store. Right, yes. Now, after 1964, it took until I think 1974 yes. for that case to be ultimately resolved. That's right. But because you've been in practice for 60 years, did you expect what you saw when you saw Rodney King being beaten? Well, I was, I was horrified at the way he was being beaten because we saw that on TV. Mm. And even the president, you know, mm -hmm. even the president, was, his first reaction was one of shock mm -hmm. because he could see himself. He's, he's not stupid. <laughs> he could see what was happening on that street, mm -hmm. that they were mercilessly beating that man to death. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, when the jury brought in the verdict of not guilty against those cops, it was inevitable that there would be a spontaneous uprising. Because of your practice, did you find yourself saying that I thought this might have changed by now, or did you find yourself saying, we kept trying to tell the authorities that this kind of thing goes on all the time and has really never stopped? Well, I, uh, throughout my life, I've seen the rise and fall of uh, the oppression of the black people. At, at sometimes it's alleviated. There's a more liberal view, and people try to the majority population tries to show some humanity. But then it reversed now, particularly in a depression, in a great depression, and we're in a great depression now. Then you have uh, the great rise of tension and hostility against blacks. As it is now, because of this, these few steps of affirmative action, in the Forbes magazine this week's Forbes mm -hmm. magazine, they they make it plain that they think the one reason why the white uh, people of the middle class are suffering so is because the blacks are getting preferential treatment. So that is the kind of relationship between the economy and the kind of actions that we see police taking. Absolutely. Let me go back with you for a little bit because those who have noted your career defending the oppressed and defending people in the southern United States may not know that you had, you were raised in Long Island University, you were part of a predominantly white community, and before you went to Syracuse University, you were not really aware, at least not from your personal experience, of the kind of racism that existed in the United States. Why was that? That's, that was true, because we lived, my family lived in a, a, a village, Lindbrook, Long Island, and we were the only black family. And uh, when I graduated from high school, uh, I was the only one who was going to go to college because these were farmers, white farmers and, and tradesmen. And so their children didn't go to college. They just went on and be married later. So I was the only one going to college. And they, the white people had a cake sale uh -huh. 
to raise money to send me to Syracuse University. So naturally, <laughs> I did not have a feeling that there was uh, great prejudice. Even though my grandmother had told me of some things, I felt that in the North, there was not that kind of feeling. And, and at Syracuse University, I also got very fine treatment until I joined the Young Communist League. During the period when you were either joining the Young Communist League or getting that fine treatment, you began to associate, I guess, through your fraternity with a number of other young people from other colleges. Mm. One of them was Adam Clayton Powell, who was then at Colgate University. That's right. And tell our viewers how you described his behavior at that time. Well, Adam was very fair-skinned, and he had light brown hair. And so at, Syrac at Colgate, where he was, he was white. He considered himself, he passed as white. But he loved those beautiful brown-skinned black girls who, was go, who were going to Syracuse University, which was co-ed. So he would come over from Colgate on weekends. He would come over to Syracuse to be with these beautiful brown-skinned girls. And he was then one of the brothers. After you got involved with the Young Communist League and your thoughts began to turn to more serious things, was that the major influence in turning you into the kind of activist lawyer that you later became. You did have to take all of the courses that could have prepared you to be a lawyer on Wall Street if that's what you wanted to be. Yes. What was the influence that made you want to become an activist lawyer? Well, I, I think it mainly at base was uh, the depression because I came out of law school uh, in 1932 and this, we were still in a very great depression and I couldn't get a job as a, a law, a, 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 a law practitioner in any office in, in Syracuse, in the Syracuse area, although they had been so nice to me otherwise. And I came to New York City, and uh, finally, a lawyer for the first bank in Harlem, the, uh, the, uh, I can't remember the name of the bank now, but the first bank in Harlem was uh, opened by Rockefeller. Uh, Johnny Rockefeller. And the lawyer for the bank was a black man, James W. Johnson. And he hired me, of all people, nobody else would hire me, but he, being a bank lawyer, hired me even though I was a communist. Let's take a telephone call for Conrad Lynn. Thank you. You're on the air caller. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Conrad, sir, uh, I deal with a lot of attorneys, and my question is, does corporate America have a very hard time when it comes to mid-level management jobs for black Americans uh, by uh, not, uh, no, by, by uh, promoting them and uh, not asking any questions whether they're qualified or not. I don't understand your question. Well, my question is, uh, as corporate America grows and the black community grows in mid-level man management jobs, does the white uh, uh, people, corporate America people, uh, uh, the high-end staff, uh, have a hard time uh, by not promoting, just promoting people up uh, because they're afraid of not promoting people in, in, in the black community. Well, we're in a depression now, and I'm representing now, at this very time, black, uh, educated black people, well-trained, who have ha gotten mid-level mid jobs in management and now are being taken out because of the depression. They're firing them and putting whites in their place. That's exactly what's happening. That's the reality, and you're still working to defend those people. There, but there was a time after you got out of the service at the end of World War II mm -hmm. that you decided that you didn't want to practice law anymore. Why was that? Because I considered the law itself, the practice of law, corrupt. Why? I, well, see, I'd been in the Army, mm -hmm. and in the Army you have a chance to think. <laughs> See? And uh, it seemed to me that uh, there was just a little too much uh, uh, favoritism by judges and uh, the great principles of law that I'd learned under Car Cardozo and J uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes and these great lawyer, great judges of the Warren Court. Uh, they seemed to not a fit in the actual practice 
in, in, in the courts. So I was reluctant to return to the law. I thought the law was too corrupt. What made you come back? Well, I was persuaded to come back by some Harlem lawyers <laughs> and also by uh, uh, a great lawyer uh, who was the general counsel of the, of the Civil Liberties Union. I can't remember his name now. But the, the, uh, the two lawyers were both uh, veterans of the Army. One had been a major in the Army, Riddick. His name was Riddick. Mm -hmm. And they kept after me, and finally I came back to the law. We have to take a short break right now, but when we come back, we'll ask Conrad Lynn to tell me and you why he was often referred to as the lawyer of last resort. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're talking with the pioneering activist and civil rights lawyer, Conrad Lynn, and we promised Mr. Lynn that you would answer the question of why were you often referred to as the lawyer of last resort? Well, uh, <clears throat> I guess I was referred to that because there were instances where the NAACP, the national organization, uh, would not take a case because they felt it would hurt them nationally, like the kissing case where these two little... Let's talk about that for one second. Yes. The kissing case, 1958. Tell our yes. viewers what that Yes, two was little about. boys, uh, seven and nine, two little black children, were accused of uh, kissing a white girl of six on the cheek. The fact is that the white girl kissed one of them, and uh, the mother was very upset. This was in North Carolina. and. Uh, so she called the police, and they had the boys put in jail. And so that was the kissing case. Uh, why, we, was, why was the NAACP afraid to handle a case like Because that? they said it was a, uh, it was a sex case. <laughs> they called it a sex case. And, and, and uh, the head of the, NA, uh, of the NAACP, uh, he refused to take the case. And also, he barred, he tried to stop Robert Williams, who was a local president of the NACP the in Monroe, Monroe North Carolina. Uh -huh. he, he tried to block him, but uh, uh, the Nation magazine persuaded me to go in because the NACP would not take it. And that's how I got in the case. In, in, in addition to which, you would take the case of members of the Socialist Workers' Party, those people yes. who were dismissed as Trotskyists, Trotskyists right. by members of the Communist Party that's right. and seen as as left-wing nuts by members of the establishment, yeah. they would have to come to Conrad Lynn. Yes, that's true. And uh, the, and even after the Communist Party expelled me, because they expelled me, <laughs> uh, I still defended the Communist leaders. That is amazing. But for uh, those people who may think that most of this book talks about the occurrences that took place in the past, yeah. let us talk a little bit about the future. Yeah. Because of your orientation, not only as an attorney, but as a thinking human being, you have always felt very strongly about how this society needs to be organized, why there are depressions and recessions, and what we need to do to get out of it. What is the prescription? Yes, well, as a matter of fact, uh, I was so affected by the Great Depression that uh, after the war, after the Second World War, one of my friends, I, I could not understand what was the reason why we had to have these periodic Great Depressions? Now, there was a religious reason that God was, was, uh, was punishing people for their sins. Well, I had heard that in church too, but I thought there must be something else. So I was invited, I was teaching then at New York University Law School, and I was invited to West Germany, Munich, that one of the great libraries of the world, to take a crash course on what was the re reason for the depression and how do you get out of it? And there they taught me that what is really needed, because depressions are man-made, they said that it was necessary where profits were going down to fire people by the thousands, uh, put machinery in their place, 
cut down on the social services, and above all, break the unions. Mm -hmm. That was Hitler's method. Mm -hmm. And uh, von Hayek wrote some books for Hitler to put this into practice. He wrote one book called Monetary Theory and the Trade Cycle, and The Road to Serfdom was another book. Mm -hmm. This was to show that the depression is not caused by God, but by man. Mm -hmm. And of course, Hitler's motive was to create an army also to fight other capitalist nations for markets. Now, you, well, can, you characterize what we are in now not as a recession, but, but another as a, depression. A major depression. Mm -hmm. uh, the, this depression started when the crash of the stock market occurred in, at the end of 1968. Uh, mm -hmm. At the end of 68, in November 68, when the crash of the, the stock market occurred. Now, some of the writers, the serious writers, are beginning to admit this is a major depression. Now, there, there's one way that these German scholars showed me how you can get out of the depression, and that is not to have just an income tax, because that does not bring in enough. You have to get to the accumulated masses of capital that have been organized by individuals, mm -hmm. not corporate capital, but individual capital, like the man who's running for president, who ran against uh, uh, the two other Candidates. You're talking about Ross Perot. Ross Perot. Ross Perot is worth between three and four billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, the proposal I made in the pamphlet I produced after I came back from Germany called The Capital Levy, A Solution When the Cupboard is Bare, I propose that we leave these great corporate giants like uh, Ross Perot, we leave them a hundred million so they could, you know, get a new start. And then we take in one tax a capital le levy of all the holdings of people who are worth more than 100 million. Now, this wasn't just my idea. It was the idea of the owner of the nation and the publisher of the nation. And mm -hmm. He's on the masthead of the nation right now. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a multimillionaire. He was a Wall Street banker. And he publishes the nation magazine. And he came out for a capital levy. Now, if these billionaires and these people who are worth more than 100 million, if they had one tax, we could pay off the national debt and, and do all the things necessary to put the people back to work. Now, I, I'm appealing to the patriotism, Ross Perot, right on this program. I'm appealing to his patriotism. He, he's, I believe, devoted to the future of our country. He just doesn't know about the solution yet, and I'm informing him and he can lead the way. Conrad Lynn is the author of There Is a Fountain, an autobiography, a remarkable journey that is still continuing today and has a vision for the future. Let's go to the telephone. Caller, thank you for waiting. You're on the air. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much. Uh, I've really enjoyed the book. I read it in 1979 when it first came out, and I've read portions of the updated version. I just wanted to ask Mr. Lynn if he would talk about the... Uh, how his father felt about him joining the Communist Party and also his dealings with Malcolm X. Thank you. Thank you. you want to know how I joined the Communist Party? Yes. And oh, yes. Well, uh, I went to college to be a preacher of the gospel. Study religion. <laughs> and my f favorite subject was philosophy. Well, at Syracuse University, the favorite school of philosophy was German philosophy. So they had us wrestling with Immanuel Kant. Uh -huh. And then after Immanuel Kant, we had to go into Schopenhauer. Mm -hmm. And so one of my Russian friends, he was a graduate student, he suggested to me, because he knew I didn't know, that I asked the professor, are we going to study Kant's greatest disciple? I said, well, who is that? He said, it was uh, uh, Karl Marx. So I asked the professor, in all innocence, in class, are we going to study uh, uh, Kant's greatest disciple? And the, pres the professor said, who is that? I said, uh, Karl Marx. And he said, you never study that man in this <laughs> class. Well, you don't say that to an 18-year-old boy, because the very thing you forbid him from reading. That was enough for you. That you had it. to read him now. That was it. How about your relationship with Malcolm X? With Malcolm, Malcolm was a product of the prison. And he had studied, a lot of people don't understand how deeply Malcolm studied in the prison. He was a real 
intellect, a remarkable intellect, and, and he's never been paid enough credit for that. Now, they always paint him in the pictures, and even on these shows that they show down that his speech is against white people. But Malcolm had an opportunity to go to Mecca, and then he traveled in Europe and in, in, in Africa. And he realized, he told me when he came back, he said, gee, I found out that there were millions of Muslims who were not black. He was leader of the black Muslims, and he thought they were all black. No, he said, the blacks are a minority. And then we began discussing the, the basic problems of society. And Malcolm, to me, was a great influence because at the end, he realized that what we need is an alliance of all the people who are oppressed that marked him for death. You said that he liked the writings of C.L.R. James and that when you discovered that he may have been a Muslim and you were not a Christian, but you were not religious, but you were united in your anti-capitalist sentiments at that time. That's right. And that That's brought right. a certain degree of unity. Before we go, tell us also about your relationship with Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson, of course, was, uh, as you know, a great singer, but he was also a lawyer. A lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. And he had gone, graduated from Columbia Law School, very brilliant man, and he was in a very wealthy firm in Wall Street. But he was also a great singer, mm -hmm. dead at that time. And uh, uh, he found that this operation in Wall Street uh, offended him because he knew that this benefited the very wealthy and not the poor. Mm -hmm. So he left the law, he was a great singer, and became a great actor. Now, I met Paul, uh, well, I knew he was a lawyer. Adam Powell knew he was a lawyer. They always would visit uh, a, a, a restaurant up in Harlem, and the three of them, and Ben Davis, mm -hmm. Ben Davis, uh, Adam Powell, and, uh, and Paul Robeson, they were all over six feet, and I, I was the only one who was a little fella, and, and I was sitting on the, on the chair, and we would talk in this restaurant, Small's Paradise, that was the name mm -hmm. of the restaurant, Small's Paradise, and they would kid me about this communism, all of them did, but Paul was very serious, you know, Paul Robeson was extremely serious, and it was uh, then that I found out that he was, he was beginning to feel that only in Soviet Russia was there a uh, possibility for the black people all over the world to gain their freedom. Now, Paul never joined the Communist Party. He, he, certainly, never did. he certainly did not. But getting back to Adam Clayton Powell, yes. when you came back to the law, one of the first jobs you had yes. was Adam Clayton Powell was somehow trying to get ownership of a white-owned, predominantly white, or, or exclusively white apartment building. That's right. What role did you play? Well, I was his lawyer. I was his <laughs> lawyer. It was, a, it was a very difficult battle, but we were able to pull it off and in the end. So Adam really liked me. I, I was just offended by Adam because he was not so good to some of his friends and who I knew at Syracuse. And so it hurt me, and I, I withdrew. But I know that Adam was a great influence because later on he, he did such great work in Congress. The book is called There is a Fountain, the autobiography of Conrad Lynn. What you have heard today was merely one iota of the information that you'll find in this book. It is more than worthwhile reading. Mr. Lynn, not only thank you for being here, but thank you for everything you've done during your illustrious career. Thank you very much. We're out of time in this segment. When we come back, the Civil War in the Sudan. Stay with us. Uh -huh. That's wonderful. Don't leave yet. We had a great time. <laughs>